Please take your Bibles. Come with us first to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah in the Old Testament. As you turn there, we're going to look at what the, the Word of God teaches about storms in life. A lot of folks going through storms lately, aren't there? Whether it's over at Shawnee or down in Cleburne, Texas, or over at Moore, other places around the world. Life is not always fair this side of heaven. And what does the Word of God say about the storms of life? When you come to the book of Jonah, the main character is not Jonah. The main character in the book of Jonah is God. And the book flows like this. God gives Jonah a message. He refuses to take it. So God gives Jonah discipline. And the discipline comes first in a storm, and then it comes with a whale. And then God gives Jonah a second chance to take the message. And this time he goes. And then God gives Jonah a lesson in compassion and in anger management. It's a great book. It's all about God and how he can use ordinary people just like you and me. But in chapter 1, we see that God gives Jonah a storm. Look at verse 3, if you would. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. God said, I want you going east, Jonah. I want you to go over to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I'm not going to do it, God. And he went as far west as he could go. At least he tried to go west. So he paid the fare. And he went on board to go down with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Where did this storm come from? This storm came from God. God sent this storm after one man. But it wasn't just one man who received the effects of the storm. It says in verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. Notice the word God has a little G. It's not a capital G. These were men that did not know the living God. They were pagans. They were unbelievers as far as biblical truth goes. And so they worship false gods, and they are praying intensely to gods who will not answer. So they were afraid. They cried out to each to his own God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Now that's serious, folks. You see, they were in business to make money. And if they throw the cargo over, that means they lose their profit. But when it comes to choice with profit or life, if you have any common sense at all, you choose life. These men were not believers in the living God, but they knew they still wanted to live, so they got rid of the cargo. But Jonah had gone down to the inner part of the ship. He had lain down, and he was fast asleep. I'm convinced he's sleeping because he's spiritually depressed. He's spiritually exhausted. He's fighting against God. He's out of God's will, and he's running from God. And there's no depression worse than spiritual depression. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God, little g. He doesn't know the real God, and he doesn't know that Jonah knows the real God. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Every pagan unbeliever on the ship is praying to a false god. The one man who is a man of God and knows how to pray to God is sleeping rather than praying, and when they wake him up and ask him to pray, he won't do it. The one man who could have prayed doesn't do it. What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps the God 
will give a thought to us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. There's a great verse over in the book of Proverbs that says, It's man who casts the lot, but it's God who makes the number come up. I like that proverb. And the lot fell on the right man. Jonah was the guilty man. So they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? The last thing that you want to do when you're out of God's will, the last thing that you ever think about doing when you're running from doing the will of God is you do not want to give a testimony. And God made sure that Jonah gave his testimony. And you know when you're out of God's will, you try to blend in with the world, try to just go with the flow, hope nobody notices you, and sooner or later God will put you on the spot till you have to speak up. Verse 9, he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. He said, well, I'm one of God's people, and I know the God that created the heavens and the earth, and he made this ocean too. The men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, then the, sin, the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it's because of me this great tempest has come upon you. Jonah knew he was out of God's will, Jonah knew the storm came from God. Jonah knew he deserved the discipline. And when they said, how can we get the storm to stop? He said, throw me overboard and let me drown. Wrong. What should Jonah have said? He should have said, turn this ship around sail right back to Joppa, I'll get off the ship and I'll go to Nineveh and do what God wants me to do. The storm would have stopped immediately. But you know what Jonah said? God, I hate those people over there because those people are different from me and they probably hurt some of my kin folks when they put the raids into the northern kingdom of Israel and I hate those people with such a passion. They don't deserve to be saved by you, God. I hate them so much, I will drown before I'll go to Nineveh. And he's stubborn in his running from God. He's stubborn in his disobedience. So he says, just throw me in the ocean and everything will become quiet. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against you. I want you to know this, when you try to fight against God, God can always make the storm worse. He doesn't need a little dial, but if he used a dial, he could just crank it up another level. And no matter how hard these men tried to row the store to the shore, the storm got worse. God made it worse and worse and worse. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. He didn't even more hit the water till the storm stopped. It became placid. 
it became serene. It became perfectly calm, and it shook those sailors to their boots. The men feared the Lord exceedingly. What kind of God is this? He sends the storm. He calms the storm. And they feared God. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord. They worshiped the Lord. Not the pagan gods. But for the first time in their lives, these men worshiped the living God. And they did what? And they made vows. Vows are lasting commitments. They said from this day on, we're only going to worship the God who made the heavens and the earth. We're only going to worship the God who has the power to send the storm and the power to stop the storm. Now when it comes to Jonah, We all need to realize how this can apply to us. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And just quickly look at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 12, New Testament. Toward the end of the New Testament, 12th chapter, 5th verse. The Word of God says here, And you've forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son... Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises, or the next two words, every son, every daughter whom he receives. How many of God's people, how many born-again believers... How many of God's children does God discipline? Every one of us. Every one of us. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. Listen to me, folks. You cannot be a good parent and not discipline your children in love. If you discipline them without love, you're a bad parent. If you don't discipline them, you're a bad parent. But if you discipline your children in love, you're being a good parent. God disciplines every one of us in love. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which all participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. If you claim to be a Christian and you don't live like a Christian and you never get disciplined for it, it's because your claim is wrong. You're not really a child of God. Every child of God gets disciplined by God because he loves us. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father's spirits and and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good. God always disciplines all of his children in love, and he always disciplines his children for their good for our good. He disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. I like that. His discipline helps us become more holy. More holy. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God uses discipline. And when he uses discipline in my life, and when he uses discipline in your life, it hurts. But God's working to help me become more righteous. 
to help you become more holy. He's teaching us how to become more Christ-like. And folks, when we get out of God's will, and we run from God, whether it's an individual believer or whether it's a church full of believers, God will discipline us. And the storm will not be pleasant. And what should we do when we're disciplined? We should not shake our fist at God like Jonah and say, God, I'd rather die than do what you want me to do. Because you see, God can take the discipline up however much more intense it needs to go. You're not going to win when you fight God. But what we ought to do is say, God, I know you're disciplining me because I'm wrong. You're disciplining me because I've turned my back on you. Father, please forgive me. Turn me around. Help me do whatever you're calling me to do. And Lord, from this day on, I want to obey you. To stop a storm of discipline requires a prayer of repentance and an obedient life. To stop a storm of discipline requires prayer of repentance and an obedient life. You come boldly to the throne of grace in that time of need. God, forgive me. I submit my life to you. I will obey you, and God will calm the storm. So here's the storm, and the storm comes upon believers, but it also affects other people as well, because when we believers get out of God's will, we affect everyone we come in contact with, just like Jonah did those sailors. The first storm comes from God. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Let's begin in verse 35. We see another storm, but this storm is different. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, This is Jesus speaking. Let's go across to the other side. He's talking about the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and notice other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. Why, that sounds like Jonah, doesn't it? Do you think Jesus was spiritually depressed? Do you think Jesus was sleeping in the bottom of the boat because he was running from the will of the Father? No way. No way. The outward circumstances look the same. In Jonah chapter 1, there's a boat, there's a storm, and there's God's man sleeping in the boat. In Mark chapter 4, there's a boat, there's a storm, and there's God's man sleeping in the boat. But one man is sleeping because he's running from doing God's will, and the other man is sleeping because he's exhausted from doing the Father's will. He's been totally obedient. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He awoke 
And he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The interesting thing to me about this storm is how, what Jesus said when he calmed the storm. He said, quiet, be still. Peace, quiet, be still. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says that very same thing on three or four other occasions. And every time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus utters those words, he's uttering it to a person who is demon-possessed, and he's speaking to the demon because every time he would come in the presence of a demon-possessed person, the demons would all recognize that he is the eternal Son of God in flesh. And they would all say, we know who you are. You're Jesus, the Holy One. You're Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. And he would always tell them, quiet. I don't need your testimony. Quiet. Be still. And then he would cast the demon, or the demons plural, out of those who were demon-possessed. And he says the exact same words to the storm. I believe this storm did not come from God. I believe this storm came from the devil. Satan is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And I believe that Satan sent this storm to try to kill Jesus, to try to kill the apostles, to try to kill those believers in the other boats that are following Jesus. You say, well, Satan doesn't have that kind of power. I would ask you to read Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, Satan comes before God. God says, where have you been, Satan? He says, from walking to and fro on the earth. Then God says, have you seen my man Job? There's not a better man in the whole world than Job. And Satan says, it's only because you protect him. If you let me at him, I can guarantee he will curse you and want to die. God said, I'll tell you what, you're wrong. Job loves me, and Job is a godly man, and no matter what you do, he'll not curse me. You can afflict him, but you cannot take his life. Satan said, we'll see. You know what happened in chapter 1? Satan brought in marauders to steal the camels. Satan had fire come down from heaven, kill the sheep. And Satan sent a tornado. And the tornado struck the house where all of Job's children had gathered to eat together. And all of his children were killed by the tornado that Satan sent. Now, once you know this, Satan is not the creator. Satan does not have the power of God. But Satan does have more power than men. And Satan is a destroyer. And there are times that Satan can send the storm. But I've got good news. Look at this. Verse 39. He awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. 
You see, Jesus said that Satan is like a strong man. But when you work with a strong man, you have to have a stronger man who can bind him up and take away that which belongs to him or take away that which he's trying to do. And Jesus said, I am the stronger man. I am stronger than Satan. And every time a lost person gets saved, Satan is defeated, and Jesus proves he's a stronger man. What happens in this passage? The apostles prayed to Jesus, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus awoke, and Jesus rebuked the winds, and the waves, and he calmed the storm. Who does Satan attack? He'll attack anyone, but he loves to attack most those who are God's choice servants. And there are times in our lives where we have storms come because we're out of God's will. And those storms come from God to discipline us. And there are times in our lives where we're in the very center of God's will. And the storms come because Satan hates us and he wants to destroy us. But remember this, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Amen? And it's a privilege to be attacked by the devil. It's an honor for a child of God to come under satanic attack. And remember this, we can come boldly to the throne of grace in every time of need, and Jesus is stronger than the devil Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And God the Father is the Almighty One. And folks, victory is on our side when we claim the name of Jesus. There's a third storm. Turn with me, if you will, quickly. Acts 27. Acts 27. The first storm is a storm of discipline. It comes from God. The second storm is a storm of spiritual attack. It comes from the devil. But there's another type of storm. The Apostle Paul had been in jail for three years in Caesarea, and he appealed to go to Rome to plead his case. Verse 1. When it was decided that we should sail for Italy, that means Paul is going to sail to Italy, and Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is with him every time it says we. So Luke and Paul are going to sail for Italy. It says they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking a ship in Adramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, that would be along the coast of modern-day Turkey, We put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonia from Thessalonica. Verse 5, And when we sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra and Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. Verse 9, Since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, because even the fast was already the fast, is the fast for the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement has already passed in the calendar year, and because it's past that time of the year, it's now become too dangerous to sail on the Mediterranean. Because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, Sirs, I perceive the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of cargo and ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion made, paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, 
the majority decide to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, and that's not in Arizona. That's the original Phoenix in Crete, a harbor facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now, when the salt wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and they sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster. Well, I like the, the King James Version translation better. In the King James, this storm is called the Eurocyclodon. The Eurocyclodon. Put that in English. That is the European cyclone. The European hurricane, the European tornado. And they had them there every year, that time of year. It's just like if you live in Tornado Alley, which we're a part of, but across Texas and Oklahoma and the tip and across Missouri and all the way up into Illinois, that's called Tornado Alley because every spring we have tornadoes, don't we? Every year, just before winter, in the fall, they would have these storms that would come out of the northeast and they'd come rolling across the Mediterranean Sea and they hit it like a tornado or like a hurricane. And Paul said, it's the wrong time of year to go on another voyage. Let's put up for the winter. Here, verse 15. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it. We were driven along, running under the lee of a small island called Cauda. We managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, we used supports. They ran ropes around the hull of the ship, trying to keep it from breaking up in the storm. And it says in verse 18, Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Everyone on the ship gave up hope except for one man. They're driven for two weeks in the eye of this hurricane across the Mediterranean. And it looks like they'll all die. Where'd this storm come from? This was not a storm from God of discipline after a Jonah. This was not a storm of the devil trying to kill those who were righteous. This was a storm of nature. God created nature. And when man sinned, nature got out of whack. And once nature got out of whack, the longer the time goes, the more storms there will be on this earth, the more famines there will be, the more earthquakes there will be, the more there will be till the Lord Jesus comes back. And if you're at the wrong place at the wrong time, you get struck by lightning. If you're at the wrong place, at the wrong time, the tornado hits. If you're at the wrong place at the wrong time, the fury of nature unleashes itself on good people, on bad people, on all people in its way. This would be a storm that's described in science. This would be a storm described by our weathermen. But I've got good news for you. Look at verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you but only the ship. 
For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. He said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. You see, Paul had been praying that God would spare everybody on the ship. So take heart, men. I have faith in God. It will be exactly as I've told you. We must run aground on some island. When the 14th night had come, as we were driven along the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected they were nearing land. Verse 33, as day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take food, saying, Today's the 14th day. You've continued in suspense without food and have taken nothing. I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. Not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took the bread, and giving thanks in the presence to God, in the presence of all, he broke it, began to eat, and they were all encouraged. And they shipwreck after this, just as he said, and they all get to shore. You see, the God who created nature can interrupt nature anytime he chooses. He did that when he left heaven and he was born in the manger in Bethlehem, didn't he? He broke the laws of nature. God could have stopped this storm, but he didn't stop it. God gave them the grace to go through it. My friends, when a storm comes in life, you can trust God to do one of two things. He can work the miracle and stop the storm, or he can give you the grace to go through it. Does that mean there will be no deaths? No. There are times when Satan sends the storm and he kills. There are times when we're in the wrong place at the wrong time and innocent people die. But know this. God loves you. And on the other side, it'll be worth it all. And we'll see our loved ones again who know Jesus Christ. Say, Mike, I, I just don't know. I don't know why I'm in the storm that I'm going through in my life right now. Well, let me ask you to do this. Why not just ask God? You see, God is a loving Father. And if you're in the storm that you're going through because you're out of God's will... He'll let you know that. He'll let you know it's discipline. If you're in the storm because you're a godly person and Satan's attacking you, he'll let you know that. If you're going through a storm now because you picked up a germ and the germ's giving you a disease, God loves you. And he'll still use you for his glory. And he'll either remove it or he'll give you the grace to go through it. But he loves you. He loves you. Listen to me, folks. God stopped the storm of Jonah. God stopped the storm. Mark chapter 4. And God gave them the grace and answered prayer and got them through the storm in Acts 27. And if you don't, know the Lord Jesus Christ. Who can you turn to in the storm? Did you watch on TV? Did you hear him interview all the people from Moore? Did you hear the one thing that everyone said without fail when they were questioned? What were you doing? What were you thinking when the storm hit? I was praying. I was praying. One lady said, I was praying for me and my dog. She was praying. Come boldly to the throne of grace in every time of need because Jesus, our great high priest, cares and he has the power to help. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I